morning, and welcome to Your Vote 2017, the News 1130 Leadership Debate. I'm Bill Good, and I'm joined in studio by NDP leader John Horgan, Liberal leader Christy Clark, and Green leader Andrew Weaver. Each will make an opening statement of about one minute. I will then ask a series of questions based on themes like the economy, education, health care, transportation, transparency in government. Each candidate will get a chance to answer a question and rebut another candidate's answer. The second half of the debate will be questions from you, the News 1130 audience. Each leader will get a short closing statement to end the debate 90 minutes from now. And we begin with NDP leader John Horgan. And uh, the leaders have taken place in a draw just a few minutes ago for the order of speaking. Mr. Horgan drew first. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good to see you back in the broadcast studio and then grateful to be here with your listeners today to talk about election 2017. This is an election, in my view, that's about choices. Choices about keeping with the status quo, the past 16 years of B.C. Liberal government that's made life more difficult for people. Costs have been going up, hydro rates, ICBC rates, medical services premiums have doubled in that time. Life's not as affordable today as it was 16 years ago. And at the same time, the services that people depend on are also being eroded. Health care, wait times are going up, clogged uh, emergency rooms, seniors care is not there for seniors when they need it, education is a disaster after 16 years of fighting with teachers, fighting with trustees, making it harder to learn and harder to teach. We need to fix the problems that the BC Liberals have created. And lastly, I think the, the commitment that I've made in this campaign is to focus on an economy that works for everybody, not just those at the top, but the entire province. Rural British Columbia, people on the island, people here in Metro Vancouver, all across BC. They're not enjoying the benefits of British Columbia's economy. I want to make that happen. We'll get to how you're going to do that in a few minutes. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Bill. Nice to see you again. Thanks for having us on the show, and thanks to everybody for listening in. I know people are really busy. Um, and I know how hard people work to look after the people that they love. And um, I want to thank all of them for all the things that they do to make British Columbia strong, to help us build a strong future for our province. I am running for a second term because, um, you know, in these last four years, British Columbia has really got on a roll. We're just getting started, and we don't want to end that. I know it is easy for politicians to just complain but we also need leaders in this province who have a plan and only the BC Liberal Party has a plan to control government spending keep government small to cut uh, taxes by up to $900 for middle-class people in the province and to make sure that we are creating jobs we are number one in job creation in the country and we need to make sure that that keeps going we've balanced uh, five consecutive budgets so that we can invest in hospitals and schools in childcare and roads and bridges all across the province and we've, as I said, put a $900 check back, or we will be on January 1st, back in people's pockets by, um, by slicing MSP in half for the middle class. And we're able to do all that because our economy is so strong. So that's thanks to the work, the hard work of British Columbians. And um, I know that this conversation today will be a vigorous one. I'm looking forward sure. to it very much. And I'm looking forward to a chance to have a competition of ideas here on this show, talk about the plans that we have, and talk about how we are really going to keep British Columbia on a roll, keep building a bright future for our kids. Andrew Weaver. Uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you for hosting this uh, show today, and thank you to those who are watching on TV and, and uh, taking time to listen to us on AM 1130 as well. You know, four years ago, we were being told that we were going to see 100,000 jobs, a $100 billion increase in, proper, in the Prosperity Fund, a $1 trillion increase in GDP, debt-free BC, thriving schools and hospitals, elimination of PST, unicorns in each and every one of our backyards. And here we are four years later. And what has transpired? Nothing. This election is really an election about trust. Who do you trust to put your interests first, the people of British Columbia's interests first, or who do you trust to actually do what's right for British Columbians? This election, we have an option. British Columbians have an option, and that option is the BC Green Party. We've outlined a vision for an economy of tomorrow, not trying to chase the economy of yesteryear. And I encourage people to go and check their candidate out, go and check out our platform, because it is second to none. We've got a talented team, we've got great ideas, and we're there for you. For the, for the economy of tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, the economy. Ms. Clark, uh, you said four years ago you were going to work toward a debt-free BC. You've actually increased the debt by nearly $11 billion. We have um, 
Uh, we are for the first time paying off our operating debt since 1975. That is the first step to a debt-free BC. So what we're doing is, because we're growing the economy, and it's not true that nothing has happened, 220,000 jobs have been created in our province since we introduced the jobs plan. And we've made sure that more people are working than ever in the history of our province. So that has happened over these last years. We've got the lowest unemployment in the country. We are paying off our operating debt. And Bill, we only borrow to build. So the first step to a debt-free BC is making sure that we aren't uh, throwing the furniture in the fire to pay for the operating expenses, Let's make to pay the mortgage. Let's make sure we are um, we're only borrowing to build for our kids and investing in that future. And you know, I mean, you know, you look at our plan and we're the only party with a plan. It's a plan to make sure that we maintain that AAA credit rating, that we don't spend more money in interest and send it to the banks. It's a plan to keep our economy strong, and it's only when we do that, when we balance budgets and when we create jobs, that we're able to make sure we keep taxes low for people. That's a real plan, and it's a plan we've worked from for this last term, and that's why I'm seeking a second term. Mr. Horgan, you've made very expensive promises, higher minimum wage, low-cost child care, building affordable housing. How do you propose paying for those promises, and how long will it take you to deliver them? We tabled a fully costed platform last week, Bill, based on the numbers that the Ministry of Finance tabled in February. Ms. Clark tabled a budget. She didn't pass a budget. We made different choices. We looked at the dollars and revenue forecasts that were going to be coming into the Treasury, and we added two taxes to our plan. The first one is to increase the corporate income tax by 1% to put us in line with other Western provinces. And the second tax increase was going to be on those that were given a break uh, by the BC Liberals back in 2013. The highest 2% of wage earners in British Columbia have been given a break over the past four years, while everyone else has been paying more. Hydro rates, MSP premiums. Uh, the Liberals have had their hands in people's pockets except for those at the top. We want to balance that out. That will bring in more revenue to provide the services that people need. We've seen an erosion in health care, an erosion in education, seniors care. On and on the list goes. And it's time that people had a government that was working for them. That's the essence of our plan. And when I hear uh, uh, the Premier say she's the only one with a plan, that speaks to the notion that they're the only ones that can operate uh, within their means. Families do it every day. New Democrats will do that as well. But that is just not true, though. The NDP plan is not costed. Just 14 of the promises that they, that they laid out were not costed. It's a $6 billion hole in that. And yesterday, there yesterday, uh, Carol James. Made an Carol, James, of himself. Carol James came out and said that she was going to be that you were going to be rolling MSP into the tax system. She did not say that. That is one and a half million dollars. And your plan is going to be one I thought I was going to get a minute. The clock doesn't seem to be working for Ms. Clark. And the seems to be working for Mr. Weaver. I'm working for Oh, we will. Okay. Thank you. And 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 your stated plan is to almost double the carbon tax. That's going to apply to every British Columbian in the province. Whenever she gets in a corner, she makes stuff up, there Bill, is, and this is why British Columbians have no confidence in the BC Liberals. you got to use some real facts, not alternative Mr. Horgan, facts. We didn't Where's Sean make up, Spicer? Is he going to be rolling in here any minute now? <laughs> Mr. Horgan, we didn't make up five balanced budgets. We didn't make you up sold a, a Burke consistent... Mountain the only, we the didn't only real make estate up, deal to lose money in British Columbia was when the BC Liberals gave away Burke Mountain to we, rich developers. We didn't, you lost money on real estate in the lower mainland. We That's didn't impressive. make up 220,000 new jobs let's in the province, the, and we didn't make up the lowest unemployment rate in the country. All those are real achievements from a government that's had a plan, that's stuck to it, and that's remembered you've got to Time. control government spending and taxes. It. How would you get to the affordable housing you're talking about? You were talking about building over 100,000 affordable housing units, but that would be over 10 years. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we, have a, we have a $10 billion capital plan that involves building transit, which has been ignored by the B.C. Liberals. They've been fighting with municipalities rather than working with municipalities. When you build transit, when you improve infrastructure, when you build schools and hospitals, you can then build communities. The extraordinary event that happened on the B.C. Liberal Watch Bill was when the school board in Surrey, with 7,000 kids in portable classrooms, said to the municipality of Surrey, do not approve any more building permits because we don't have schools to put kids. That stalls the economy. If we make public sector investments in building schools, we can then build communities. That creates economic activity. They've been ignoring that. But you have kids in portables too. I, I don't understand. We're talking about the past 16 years of government, are we not? Well, but when uh, the NDP was in well, power, look, there were kids in portables. Yeah, well, what people want to talk about, Bill, is today and tomorrow. 
They want to know what is the government of British Columbia going to do to help them? How are we going to make life more affordable? How are we going to provide services today? Not 50 years ago, not 40 years ago, but today. And a $4.7 billion plan that is uncosted. It's a hole in the, in the budget. Know, did you see it the would have to be paid night? for did you see over 10 years. Finance last night? Just a sec, Mr. Horgan. I gave you that. a chance. Um, and, you know, and the, the, I mean, the, so there's a hole in the budget that there people have not. to pay for it's, through it's your higher taxes. It's your numbers. And there's also, the, I mean, really, it's a difference in philosophy. Our government has said we want to help people get into homes that they own. The NDP plan is to build government homes that people will never own and then give them a subsidy to try and stay in those rental homes forever. What I what I think people want and what they want for their kids is they want a chance for their kids to own their own homes. So the home program which would give up to a $37,000 no interest, no payment loan to people to help them get into their first home, the NDP have said they would scrap it. It's no, a very didn't. different... No, we didn't. Your housing critic, no, the David E.B., the read housing the critic, said that. Take a few and, minutes. Take a few minutes and read something. It's a very different philosophy. One is to say you want people to live in government housing they will never own. One is to own. say you want people to have and affordable one is to housing. Say, one is to say that I drive support, around in private wanna, jets all day talking you, to the rich about how we want to make everyone, in, everyone into a one-bedroom one condo with their families in B.C. One, one is to say that you'd like people to be in a home that they own, a place that they can call theirs that will help them really start their future and begin their lives. I think that's what most parents want for their kids. And I that's what we're going to try and deliver I'm as a government. Come Should we be realistic? To Andrew Weaver with this because if Christy Clark, you imposed a oh. tax on foreign buyers. Yeah. That seemed to cool the high end real estate a little bit, at least for a time. But will anything make housing more affordable in Metro Vancouver where land costs have escalated to about $20 million an acre? Andrew Weaver, do you have a path? To affordable housing? Thank, thanks for asking that. And what is quite ironic is, in fact, housing has become unaffordable precisely under this premier's watch. This for, uh, the, it, it, it used to be a place in Vancouver where you could afford to live. But to so be fair, it's, it's bit, unaffordable in Sydney, Australia, San Francisco, Paris, London, all big international cities are having to readjust away from single family homes in a metro area. There's no question, but it has got out of hand here in British Columbia because of, a, because of the fact that the issue of affordability was ignored. We've had 16 years of mean-spirited policies that have put corporate donors and those who have ahead of those who do not have. We've seen growing income disparity between those who have and those who haven't, and that's wrong. Our plan is, we have a plan. Our plan, first off, would be to take the foreign buyer's tax, apply it across British Columbia, and double it to 30%. It clearly has not worked because this government has actually budgeted in their budgets increasing revenue from the foreign buyer's tax. If they believed it truly would limit forest buyers, they wouldn't budget revenue from it. We've also got a plan to make property transfer tax progressive so that those people buying homes under a million dollars would actually see a reduction in property tra transfer tax and those people buying mega mansions would actually see an increase we make it we make it so that you could not buy agricultural land in British Columbia over five acres if you do not reside and pay taxes in Canada this is similar to what has happened in Alberta in Saskatchewan in Manitoba Quebec and PEI again this government's let it get away from them and acts in a reactive fashion instead of putting in place policy measures to ensure that we actually don't get to the place we're in but would you also impose a capital gain Gains tax on people who sell their homes, not speculative homes, but their homes that they've saved money to acquire and to pay for over 25 years, would you imp impose a capital gains tax on them? If you look at our platform, what, the, what we have proposed have. is if, if, you are, if you own your home for five years, there is no capital gains tax. If you, if you buy a home for a year, move to another home for a year, you pay capital gains tax on a lifetime amount over, uh, uh, over $750,000 profit. And the reason why we're doing that is we're trying to ensure that the speculative market is actually tampered. That is, people who buy a home and they literally move homes every year or six months because you pay no capital gains tax on your private residence, that leads to a speculative marketplace. We're only addressing those people. We're not addressing, you know, a, a mom and dad who age in their place and have lived in a house for 10 years, or we're not addressing the family that moves from the condo up to the single family home as they age. Uh, we're addressing people who are speculating, who are flipping houses in five years and living in, in them as a means of avoiding capital gains tax. That's well, a pretty substantial policy. Would you? 
you At agree? At least he has or a plan, did, Bill. Yeah, but would you disagree with his plan? I would I would agree with parts of it. The um, property purchase tax is already progressive, um, and so I certainly support that part. I support the part of it that suggests we want to support, we want to give people a break on the property purchase tax for less, uh, for lower cost homes. So, and we've already done that, about $13,000 uh, property purchase tax break on about, on homes that are up to $750,000. I, though, you know, philosophically, I think I agree with both of my colleagues, disagree with both of my colleagues here, because yes, we are spending almost a billion dollars building uh, affordable housing in the province, but we are equally focused on making sure people get into a home that they own. And it's really hard for first time home buyers in this market to scrape together that first time down payment that they need. So if someone can get, you know, if people can get approved by a bank, but they can't get their, they can't get their down payment together and get into their first house. So we're doing something that WAC Bennett did, which is to support people with a no interest, no cost loan. The NDP housing critic said he wants to scrap that program. We disagree because I think we all want our kids to be able to own the home that they live in rather than just be a renter for the rest of their lives. I think it's a, it's a, a very, so it's a very different so philosophy to, for, that we to have. people who have spent their entire lives in rental housing because they can't afford anything else. If, an, if the wages have been flat for a decade, Bill, we have among the lowest minimum wages in the country. The economy is not working for everybody. And for the Premier of British Columbia to say, if you're a renter, you're a second class citizen. Let's help that's them get just, into their own well, homes. It's not a that simple. A lot of people who rent it, would it like to be able to do that. It may be like that in the first class lounge, Ms. Clark, but in the rest of the but world, yeah, but you, people are struggling. And you want to, but don't but is it practical for program, everybody though, to be able, John. in this kind of a market, Absolutely. To, to own? It's not. It, the, the, the benchmark price for a home in Metro Vancouver went up $600,000 in two years. And the Premier said, that her housing minister said, kids should start saving up for a, for a, a, a down payment their teens when they're delivering newspapers. That's ridiculous. When they've tripled tuition fees, how are you going to get into university? How are you going to get into colleges? How are you going to get a trade when you're saving for your first home? Which would take, based on the, the minimum wage today, 40 years to but do none it. of this is unique to British Columbia. Well, no, well, but we are unique to British Columbia. Bill, we want to lead a government. I think we should focus on the, the issues that are uh, the relevant here in British Columbia today. And what's happening today is people are struggling. It's not affordable to live in Metro Vancouver. So what do we do? We hollow out our cities. We want vibrant cities, not vacant cities. You know what you need I, to be I, able to pay for a home? You need a job. And under the NDP we need plan, a good job. Yeah, Thank you. you need a Thank good you. job. And so in British, in British how's Columbia, take home pay is going up. 220,000 new jobs. 90, well, where is take home pay going 90, up? Show me that statistic. Over 90% of them Let me just are take full that time. Link. Have you got a link for that? Are full time jobs. And, you know, under both of my colleagues, um, you know, their proposals, British Columbia would go back back to where we were in the 1990s when we had the highest unemployment in the country we had um, we had youth unemployment was higher than anywhere else west of Quebec is it 2017 we were, bill British Columbia what, what's British the date Columbia here? was struggling and what we it's see it's April 2017 Ms. what, Clark. We, what are you going to do for but, people today who what, can't afford to get into and, a home who are struggling and, to pay their rent can't pay their hydro see, bill and, are going to and, food and, banks so to feed their kids can I finish I'll come back and let you tell me what you're going to do for them and what we I mean what we see with the NDP scheme that they've put forward is it's the same old playbook from the 1990s and it's the same old starting lineup from the 1990s. Don't imagine that if they're going to carve a six billion dollar hole in just with just 14 promises in our budget that we're not going to end up once again being the highest tax jurisdiction in the country and the lowest uh, the highest unemployment jurisdiction. You can't afford anything if the government's taking too much money out of your pocket and if you don't have a job Job. We want to make sure that we lower taxes and create jobs for people. But you That's also how we make life, help make, make life housing. more affordable. Absolutely. So how do you get and affordable housing? And you need to do all housing, free bill, is what Mr. I would say. Oregon. When I talk to CEOs of tech companies, for example, one of the fastest growing sectors in our economy, despite the government, not because of the government, they say their biggest challenge, Bill, is uh, attracting and recruiting new workers. The, uh, 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 one of the major companies, I won't name it, a major company who set down roots here in British Columbia to make sure they could capture some of the the tech uh, 
graduates from UBC, software engineers coming out of the University of British Columbia to keep them in Vancouver. And they're going right past that head office to Redmond, Washington, because they can afford to buy a house there. They can still go to Whistler, takes another half an hour to get there. They can still enjoy the benefits of living in the Lower Mainland, but they're south of the border and they can afford to live. The biggest challenge for the economy is not the tax rate, it's can you afford to live in the community where those jobs may well be. That's the challenge. And we have to make significant steps in building new housing. But how do you, how do, you do that without that. depreciating the housing costs that focus, people have already got and are invested in? Focus on speculation. And that's where the Liberals missed the boat on, the, on their epiphany. Uh, just a year ago, a year ago, Bill, the, the Premier of British Columbia was saying life is affordable in, in, low, in the Lower Mainland. You're making this stuff up. And then in the dark of summer, when everyone was on holidays, they brought in a measure to try and curb the growth in costs. But they missed the significant issue, which is the speculative market. Mr. Weaver's proposed something. I haven't heard anything about speculation from the Premier other than keep the, keep the game rolling for her developer backers. We proposed to tax people who don't pay income taxes in British Columbia. Those are the true speculators. People who are buying a commodity, a condominium, a floor of condominiums for speculation. If they're not paying tax in British Columbia, they're not growing the economy. But aren't they, aren't they paying a capital gains tax when they sell that property? Not if they're not paying taxes in British Columbia. If they roll it into a blind trust, which has happened, I, uh, there was one example of a, pro a property on Nelson Street uh, that was purchased by significant British Columbia developers for $16 million and went over a weekend on Facebook for $60 million. Yeah, and that was now, because it was know, put into a blind trust. It, it wasn't, it wasn't real estate that was being moved. It wasn't real estate that was being tax, moved. Mr. Horgan. Let me and give life does not become Andrew, more affordable when you roll Andrew MSP Weaver into people's income taxes, what is, which uh, would mean a 20% increase Weaver, in people's taxes. Thank you, Bill. Um, you know, I raised the issue of bear trust three years ago in the legislature, and this government ignored it. It was clear then that it was a problem. I raised the issue in question period and estimates, pointing out, and I knew this was happening, that what was going on is people were purchasing properties in trusts and flipping corporations who own the trust, paying no property transfer tax. The government's response is, we think that there might be unforeseen consequences if we deal with it. Another thing we, we've let the Premier get away with here that we shouldn't is she talks about the, the economy in terms of GDP. Well, GDP is an artificial measure. Why are we not talking about the fact that for eight years in a row we've led the country in child poverty? Why are we not talking about the fact that we have a homeless problem that's out of control? Why are we not talking about the problem that we're, we have a fentanyl crisis in BC that is second to none in the, in the, in the province? And that's because, yet again, of 16 years of mean-spirited policies that have put corporate donors and the wealthy ahead of those who are trying to make ends meet, you end up seeing the social problems that we're seeing today. We have a plan to address them, and I encourage okay. people to go and look at that. I want to challenge you on something, because the fentanyl problem. Yep. How do you deal with it? I mean, to to me, just watching it every night on the news, it's 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 frustrating. It's upsetting. Mm -hmm. But I go, what can government do seriously? There's and you know we have a plan for this. First off, I will commend Terry Lake, the Minister of Health, for with his harm reduction program. It was an uh, an after the fact, uh, an effective way of dealing with harm reduction. But the real question is this, is this: Why are people there in the first place, and how do we get them on a path to recovery? Our plan is a historic investment in public education. We've had a generation of, kill, of kids who've gone through the school system with cuts to child psychologists, cuts to speech pathologists, cuts for the services that they need, and what we, our approach is to reinvest in our, our, our kids when they're young to ensure that as we move forward, they don't end up in situations with mental health problems and also provide a pathway to recovery through investment in mental health and addiction services to get people off the streets afterwards. Would, would any of you go to the Portugal model? It was uh, featured last night, I think it was on the National, and it, it showed how they decriminalized virtually all drugs. They didn't legalize them, but they decriminalized them and they turned it into a health care issue where everyone who was uh, taking drugs of any kind went to treatment and was treated as a health care issue and did not go to jail. Absolutely. The sellers went to jail. So, so it, it, within our plan, we, we recognize that the, the model uh, that's being experimented on downtown east side that the UBC is running with prescription heroin, there's some p potential there. There's some potential there if we start to treat this as a health crisis. And it's actually a smart thing to do from a financial point. Portugal, Switzerland, a number of jur jurisdictions have recognized that addiction is a health issue. It's not a criminal issue. And so this is the kind of way we need to start thinking of it. it ultimately, we save, save, we save money in doing so, and it's better for the people 
people who, who, are, who are better treatment for the people as well. Ms. Clark? Um, well, can I can I just start with this? Because I my son's 15, and um, you know, all of us think about our kids when we think about opioids. That's the first person we think about. Yep. And it's I mean it's over a thousand people or about a thousand people have died. Um, in British Columbia, and Last year, we've got a few hundred before that, and 300 this year already. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a really. And so, I would. What I would say is, it's. Um, we can't treat it as just a as a law enforcement issue, um, and we shouldn't treat it just as a political issue either. I think all of the, you know, all of my colleagues have said that this is above politics. Um, so we've spent about 100 million dollars. Uh, so, you know, to, we've. You know charge that into the system to try and make sure that we're, we're stemming <coughs> this crisis. Sadly, you know, what's happened is the numbers have just stabilized at about 100 deaths a month, which is just way, way too high. So we've got to keep, uh, we've got to keep doing more to do that. We've got, we were the first province to declare a national, or to declare a, a public health emergency, the first province to deschedule naloxone for life-saving, for life-saving uses from our emergency para, uh, paramedics and emergency personnel. We're the first province to establish a joint task force with law enforcement and health. We went to Ottawa, persuaded them to ban pill presses, persuaded them to give um uh, CBSA the, the ability to be able to look at small packages that are coming in persuaded them to go and work with the Chinese to try and stop the flow of these drugs into our country we are still working hard to make sure that the RCMP contingent in drug interdiction is increased in our province we're really under on that so we've got more work to do and we've got to get out there and support people finding their way off these dangerous drugs no we all know nobody should be using drugs but people do and everyone who dies is someone who is loved and we need to remember that every single one of those people deserves our help. Mr. Oregon. Thank you Bill. Uh, this is indeed a, a provincial crisis and it has been in place for not just one year but two or three years and, and the trend has been going upward. It's been evident to uh, health care professionals. It's certainly been evident to first responders and the challenge I believe for all of us is that we need to take concerted cooperative action. I, I have to uh, call the Premier on a couple of her points. Firstly, uh, she said she went to Ottawa to persuade the federal government to bring in a law banning pill presses. My colleague Mike Farnworth introduced a private member's bill to do just that here in British Columbia and it was completely ignored by the Premier for, for half a year while another 600 people died. It is it's a combination of issues as we've all agreed. There's law enforcement, uh, there's safe injection sites which are not uh, increasing at the rate that I think is necessary to address this issue and more importantly I think we need to have treatment facilities in place to help people. When you present Bill at a hospital with a broken arm or you're hemorrhaging blood you get immediate attention but when you present with a mental health challenge or an addiction challenge if there's no bed for you you're told to come back later and that's a critical problem here we need to have services for people when they seek help but how do we get well, you, you, well the shortage of our, our health care professionals well, then you, shortage then of psychiatrists then you, train, then you train more bill you, 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 if it's a crisis if there's a fire burning in, in the interior we don't wait to see if we've got the budget for it we don't wait we ask people to come together and put that fire out we have a fire in our major cities and right around British Columbia this is not but it takes downtown. years to train a psychiatrist and, and well, we need it, hundreds but, it, of but it's not just psychiatrists bill you need to have care providers in place. Our plan calls for a minister of health, mental health and addiction. So there's a champion at the cabinet table, uh, and, I, and I agree with uh, Mr. Weaver that the minister of health has done the best that he could, but he's got a whole bunch of other things on his plate at the same time. If you had a champion for mental health and addictions who got up every single day with the responsibility to the people of British Columbia to make sure services are there for people when they need them, you're going to make a lot more progress. Can, and I, just, I, uh, can I just add, though? I think. Are you going uh, okay. uh, oh, to? I wanted to, to, I wanted you, to I guess, compliment Bill? you on saying something nice about. Terry Lake, if that's okay. Because I think, you know, Terry Lake has been a Who's real champion. I, I, I think we should, right? focus, on, I think and, we should focus on the issue, Bill, and, and I think I should have as much time as the Premier to answer those questions. You'll, I'll leave it up to you, but if you if you want to just keep doing your thing, I'll watch you for a while. I know you like that. Well, I, I did, I did want to say thank you brief, for complimenting I, Terry, because he brief. has been a champion for this, and I think people, it short Bill, changes him. This to, is an election about people, it, not about politicians, it short, it, and, and this government it, has failed the people of B.C. when it comes to this issue, because they haven't worked aggressively 
aggressively, and they haven't worked cooperatively. I think, I I think, like it, I think it sure changes Terry Lake to say that he hasn't been it's a not about Terry Lake. and woken it's up not every about day Terry Lake. thinking it's about, about people, this. Clark. And I don't, and I, and I don't, and and I don't think this is about politics, you, John. Oh, you're just, I think, you're I all think, politics all I do the time. You don't know anything but politics, Mr. Clark. I do think this is about people. It's about our kids. It's about people like my son. It's not about your son. It's not about your son. It's about daughters and their husbands and their wives. Thank you, Bill. I wanted to to say that I, I agreed with John on the uh, need for a Minister of uh, Mental Health and Addictions. It's also in our platform. That was recommended by third parties. It's a, it's a good idea because this, but it, when you have the, 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 the budget as one health care budget, what ends up happening is you, you end up realizing that aspects of it get uh, put off to the side. Right. We have a, we have a health care system right now that's, that's essentially top heavy. It's funding acute, not chronic care. It's not funding preventative care. And we too have a plan that as a, as a ministry as well that also would uh, ensure that we actually uh, fund heavily in prevention as well as moving the chronic system out of the acute system. We have far too many beds in hospitals being used to, to house the or to, to, to look after those who are chronically ill. They shouldn't be there. They should be in external areas and, and we have a plan to do that. In terms of the training as well, you know, one of the things we need to recognize is that there's a whole new generation of people out there. Doctors want to be doctors. They don't want to be administrators. We have a system where family doctors are spending a day and a half a week filling out paperwork because of, a, because of the red tape that was brought in with respect to, uh, you know, billing. So our approach would be to to actually go to the medical community, work with them to get more doctors on salary, introduce nurse, nurse practitioners in, 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 who cannot bill directly, and also to focus on community health as opposed to top-down hospital health. Okay, to another topic, tolls. Suddenly, Christy Clark, you've decided to cap tolls on the Port Man and Golden Ears Bridge. Why now? Why not when the bridge was built? And I'll get to John Horgan on the same topic you in bet. a moment. You bet. Um, well, I would, because we can afford it, Bill, because the economy is growing. The well, no, because the economy is growing. 220,000 jobs, over 90% of them full time, created since we introduced the jobs plan. That means, you know, 65,000 people just from other provinces have come here. That means our economy is growing. It means we have the revenue that we need. I mean, this is part of our plan, um, and we're sticking to the plan. Plan. That's our, what you'll see in our platform. A six on the, you know, on the left, you see the uh, six billion dollar hole in the in the platform, not, and not which will undoubtedly be seen in higher taxes. On the on the, on the other left, you see a bigger number than that. You can't afford to do good things for people if the economy isn't growing. So in the 1990s, the NDP didn't build a single hospital. They had to cut health care. They had to cut the number of beds, and they had to cut the number of doctors doctors We're being untold. trained yeah. and the number of nurses because they couldn't afford to look after people. When we want, when we say we want to be able to cut tolls, it's because we can afford it because the economy is growing. So balancing the budget, controlling government spending is all related to making sure that we can cut tolls and taxes. It's all related to making sure that we can create jobs. It's about a thousand dollars in a daily commuter's pocket uh, south of the Fraser and we want to make sure that we are delivering that to people with uh, you know w as a relief without raising their taxes out of the other out of the other yeah it, it's about a thousand dollars in savings we're not doing though, the minute right? thing anymore is so, that, uh, we're, I'm trying to be fair okay okay, okay. <laughs> all right calm down John because John oh, you don't promised touch me again please you <laughs> have <laughs> promised to scrap tolls yeah. all together. Yeah. So how will you make up the hundreds of millions there? By using the fake prosperity fund to, to, for, in our three-year fisc three fiscal plan, we're going to take the money that she took from medical services premiums and called it LNG revenues, and we're going to put it into making life uh, better for people south of the Fraser. The only people, Bill, that pay, uh, pay tolls in British Columbia are people that live in Surrey, Maple Ridge, and Pitt Meadows. We don't pay tolls in Kelowna, where the new bridge was built there. We don't pay tolls on the Sea to Sky Highway. We only pay tolls on the Portman and the Golden Ears Bridge. And what's that doing? It, it's moving moving people from those new pieces of infrastructure onto the older ones. There's congestion at Patella, there's congestion at Alex Fraser, which is causing crisis in those communities. At the same time, we have these new pieces of infrastructure that should be public assets for all of us that are not being used because of the price that these people, the BC Liberals, put on people. They've had their hands in pockets of people living south of the Fraser, and the consequence is they're not using that infrastructure. So if we move people back and forth over that infrastructure, it'll relieve pressure on the other bridges in the region, and it'll keep the economy moving. If we have truckers that are 
backing up because they want to go on the Patello, instead of using the, the Port Man, that slows down our economic activity. This is going to put money right into people's pockets. They're going to use the infrastructure, and it'll grow the economy. Well, well Ms. We, uh, Ms. Clark has uh, started work already on a Massey Tunnel replacement. Three and a half billion dollars. A, why a bridge? B, why a bridge with no referendum? And, or support um, from the mayor's council, Bill. And, and how do you support the, 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 the argument that once you relieve the pressure on the Massey Tunnel, you have the same problem when you hit the Oak Street Bridge? There's no plan for relieving the congestion 15 miles down the road or kilometers. Well, we can do one thing at a time, and this is a this bridge is you know I know the NDP want to cancel it, but the reason we're doing the bridge is because it makes more sense than a tunnel. The tunnel is not seismically sound, so it does need to be replaced, and it connects communities. And I know mayors do a, you know they do their job looking after their communities. Somebody has to look out and after don't want a bridge. how we connect communities. Except but no one. can I just go back a little bit because there is another uh, thing that you know that's really a stark contrast between us. We have built a prosperity fund, $500 million for our kids from non-renewable resource revenues. The NDP want to raid that kids, our kids' savings account and they want to blow through it in two to three years. My parents would never have done that to me and I think most of us would never want to do that to our kids. You put money aside for your kids, you leave it there for your kids and the money comes from among other things, non-renewable resources, among other and when things, those and when those and when those resources are no longer there, they're not there for our kids. Let's put that money aside. Let's not raid the kids' savings account for heaven's sakes. We don't need to do that. But you, we don't need you to spend insisted money. four years ago on a referendum for transit funding. We've lost four years. No referendum. On a Massey Bridge, why? Because it can. It's not. It's between communities. It's not with, and it's a provincial transit, asset. Transit's not it between is not. Communities? It is not a trans link. Transit's not between. It's not a trans But can I also add this though, Bill? The uh, we haven't gone nowhere. We are matching the Trudeau government's 2.2 billion dollars for transit. And again, another stark contrast. The NDP have said that they want to give the mayors the right to be able to hike people's taxes, vehicle levy, sales tax. Who knows what it would be? We are still committed to making sure Bill. that if there is any new revenue source yeah. required from cities Andrew or from, Weaver, for, for, and from TransLink, I, we will go to a referendum. I, I, I on really that. need we won't to, just let them to hike jump taxes. in here, Bill. I mean, yeah. I have seen here so many alternate facts being put forward. We really have to move forward. Look, this government abdicated its responsibility to show leadership on transit. We had a referendum that was not on transit. It was about the management of TransLink. And sadly, you know, we, we move forward without moving forward with the 10-year plan. The BC Greens understand... It was about taxes, Andrew. It was, no, it was not. It was about it was about you abdicating your responsibility right. to show leadership in Metro Vancouver. We have a plan. We have a plan to fund the actual uh, mayor's 10-year plan because we recognize that that's important. We also won't go down the path of actually playing politics by eliminating or, or playing with tolls. We believe that tolls are in place for, for and they have a, a meaning for, for being there. They're there to ensure that the infrastructure is paid for, that those who use it pay for it. It's good public policy. And so we, we will leave the tolls in place. But what we will do, and we've said this, is we will continue to show leadership in the carbon pricing, and that will provide revenue that the municipalities can use to, to, to deal with infrastructure deficit, including transit. Massey Tunnel, this is yet another make work project because it's not it's you know the mayors don't want it what we if we needed capacity there what we should be doing is investing in transit and it's much cheaper to build tunnels you could have twinned the tunnel if there was a need to do that it much much cheaper everybody knows that but this is about mega projects and ribbon cutting and 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 it's really not about putting people first. I want to get each of you to comment on what, I'm all in what, favor of making work on what for I iron think, workers and other folks who need jobs what I think everybody has been avoiding for some time is road tolls yeah. road pricing I mean, you're either going to take all of the costs of all of the transportation construction and put it into general revenue, which means higher taxes for everybody, or you're going to have to work out a system where everybody who drives pays a share of their driving. That's good public policy. You know, that's good public policy that's, that's being used around the world that those who use should pay for what they use. You know, we, we people... But it's also fair. You're not it hitting... Is. It is. You're not hitting south of the Fraser exactly. and saying you're going to have an enormous 
bill every year. I know you in West Vancouver and North Vancouver, you can drive your bridges every we day. We had tolls on the Coquihalla when it was first yeah. put in to pay for the Coquihalla. Across Canada, they introduced tolls on roads to pay for those roads. It's the right thing to do, and it's good public policy, and it doesn't burden future generations with the, with the promises of today. This government's approach, of course, is to double the, the debt that we're leaving behind at the same time as touting the mantra of debt-free BC. We believe that the user, the, the user pay model is actually central to, to kind of good public policy. So, John Horgan, do you have a problem with road pricing? I, I'd like to go back to the Massey Tunnel replacement because the Premier made some uh, outrageous statements in, in her comments there. First of all, she said that this was uh, provincial leadership. We have uh, mayors in the region who have been grappling with the trade-offs, the horse trading that's required to make sure we're meeting the needs of everyone in Metro Vancouver. We need buses in Maple Ridge. We need to address congestion at Massey. We need to replace the Patella Bridge. There's no shortage of infrastructure investments that need to be made that will create will create jobs and will put people to work and will uh, stimulate economic activity but when you have one player at the table the premier saying to the mayors around the region who are as you know a diverse group of people they're not new democrats they're not liberals they're not conservatives they're a diverse group of people and they have sat down and figured out how they can move forward they nearly and all they came together on a transit plan that exactly. they actually agreed on and the premier wouldn't play the premier said no i know better and no, the people not, voted it down well well the, the question that was posed was, as, as Mr. Weaver quite rightly said, was not about do we need infrastructure in the Lower Mainland. It was how do you like TransLink? And yeah, you know exactly. that question is not going to get a favorable answer. So what maybe we, more now than then. Well, well, now because we're four years down the road and and the crisis is greater than it was then. We have wasted. Well, there's four, new leadership at TransLink. Well, but that's again, it's not even the, the issue of TransLink. It's it's four years of gridlock, four years of congestion, four years of people watching buses go by. And if you want to get people out of cars, you need need to give them the alternatives. And if you want to make sure that people are using transit, you need to invest in it. The Liberals have failed to do that. They've instead imposed a four and a half, three and a half, four and a half, how many billions of dollars solution that is only their solution. I think you need to work with people. I think you need to sit down, roll up your sleeves, and say to the mayors, how do we work together? Having the federal government, uh, Mr. Trudeau, coming to the table is outstanding on a whole range of issues we're going to talk about as the day goes by. But the federal government has been out of the game on housing. They've been out of the game on child care. And now they're coming to the table with an increased investment in transit, and we need to capture that, not fight with mayors. And we are. $2.2 billion to match the Trudeau government's commitment. Days, and the George, days, and days the, before and the, the election George, started, the a year Massey ago, Bridge, I said we should do that, and, and the, you, you laughed at it. And the George Massey Bridge, which will create 14,000 jobs for people, amongst them iron workers and, and people, um, you know, people who've been in unions and for a long time and who need that work. But we also need to clear up the biggest gridlock in the lower mainland, which is around the George Massey Tunnel. That's what the bridge is about. It's about making sure we give commuters a little more time, we but lower the impact the on climate change. Yeah, it's exactly. down the road. And, we, and, exactly. and Bill, over the years, we're, I mean, the, the Portman Bridge, Which uh, is something, something, that, the, toll on it. something yeah. that the NDP That's opposed. Um, the uh, the South Perimeter Road, something no that the NDP, no the something that the NDP opposed. That? See the Sky Highway, Canada Line, all of these, no and tolls, now of course, no and now of course, Site C, Kinder Morgan, Pacific Northwest LNG, T2 at Delta. The NDP opposed all those projects, all of which will create thousands of jobs for working people. So what I would say is, there's only one party with a plan to support working people Actually, in British true. Columbia, yeah. and it's the BC Liberal Party. If you yeah, look at our plan, what you see is a focus on jobs, you see a focus on making sure that we're leaving more money in people's pockets, and that's remembering people who go to work every day and work hard and need a government that's going to support uh, we're them. We're getting now. close to the halfway point. Yeah. I have a couple of other issues that I want to get to before I go to the listeners. Uh, the Ombudsman recently released a damning report on the firing of eight health researchers. In his report, he stated you, Ms. Clark, had not recalled being briefed by staff on the firings before they happened. You later told reporters that you asked a lot of questions about those firings. After they happened. So both that is true. I told him what I what you what he quoted was absolutely correct, and I certainly talked to. Um, I was briefed on it after it happened, uh, because those firings, as he said, were done by the civil service without any political interference, um, and as they you know, as they should have been. Know what's going on? As here? they should have been done. Well, I mean, hiring and firing within ministries in a you know in a government that employs over thirty thousand people happens. Um, with deputies making those decisions. 
if politicians are in the business of hiring and firing people in the civil service, I think we're all in a lot of trouble. And that's one of the things that the ombudsman said, that this shouldn't have happened, first of all, and he was right about that, that the civil service um, uh, was responsible, uh, is responsible for making it right, and he's right about that. We are, I am going to be supporting them in making sure that we get this done right. We've got an, a Supreme, a former Supreme Court judge overseeing the process because we want the British Columbia government to be the best place to work in the province. And if it's also and alleged we, we need to make sure that things are done. investigation that turned out to be bogus. There was no RCMP I'd investigation. I'd also like to be able to get this on the record. So there's a premier saying that the deputy minister fired these people without the minister or her office knowing about it? The minister uh, made an announcement. Absolutely. She stood at a press conference and made an announcement that was the greatest uh, breach of privacy in the history of the After public service. After it had been done. No, no, she did. She stood up. She started the ball rolling. She had a press conference uh, in September of 2012 and made allegations about individuals that were absolutely not true, and it led to the death of an individual in 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 December of 20. 13, her deputy minister, the deputy minister of health, and her chief spin doctor had a meeting, according to Mr. Chalk in his report, had a meeting and acknowledged they had made a fatal error. Fatal in every sense of the word, Bill, and they did nothing. They did nothing until I, uh, the official opposition, and Linda Kafish, the sister of Rod McIsaac, had a press conference nine months later, Bill. Nine months later. The cover up is gr more d d disappointing than the actual crime in this case. And for the Premier, for five years, to now say it wasn't about me and my government, it was about somebody else, well, is just outrageous. That is what the Be responsible. Said. Be responsible for your that government. Your <laughs> minister stood up and made allegations of a people that were not true, publicly, we, that repeatedly. Is, Bill, we're, that is what the Ombudsman said, but can I just also add, because I didn't, I, I, I want to make, this is a tragic event, and it should never, ever have happened. It is completely unacceptable. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, in government, we all have to take responsibility for that. But, you know, the Ombudsman did say there should never be political interference in who gets hired and fired, and in this case, there wasn't. But that does not take away from the tragic outcome that happened. We are that starting to encroach on listener time, but I have one more issue that I must ask. Christy Clark, you've pushed ahead with Site C, at least eight billion dollars. Many say we don't need the power and won't for decades. Why now, and why no review by the Utilities Commission? There have been 10 years of reviews on Site C. Not by the Utilities and, Commission? No, not but by an independent panel. Hired ten by years, who? Hired ten by year, who? Ten years of by work BC that was Liberals. done on it. I mean, I know both the NDP and Greens are united in trying to stop the project. There are 2,100 people working on that site today. How many from British Columbia? These guys want to, 80 percent, these guys want to make sure that they send every single one of them a pink slip. I want to make sure that they're working. So yes, we want to make sure that people in the northeast of our province and across the province are <coughs> working we are a jobs focused government and we believe in getting to yes on projects but we also know the experts have told us that our demand for electricity over the next in 10 years will go up by 40 percent our population is growing well the experts yeah. in electricity planning are telling us that there will be and, and of course there will be as our so population we grows increasing demand in the we don't, for a decade. Okay, one, one quick response from John and Horgan. So we're, our kids are going to need that power John Horgan Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, as you know, I know a lot about this subject. And uh, energy demand has been flat for a decade. Yeah. It's been flat for a decade. Cost Absolutely. of energy has been going down, not up. And we're spending more money than we have to on energy that's a long way from the, the load center without utilities approval commission. That Those are the experts, Ms. Clark, not the people you hire. The liberal appointed board, the liberal appointed CEO hire liberal uh, consultants to tell them it's the right way to go. We have a utilities commission to protect the people of BC from politicians that make choices for their polit political party, not for the can public. Can it be stopped? Well, yes, we're going to have. We're going to. We're going to put the question to the Utilities Commission, as uh, the the reviewer of the, the project, Mr. H Dr. Harry Swain, suggested. We're going to go to the Utilities Commission and say, how much damage has this government done in their desire to get past the point of no return, rather than doing good public policy? Andrew Weaver, we'll Bill, the that. NEB was very clear. That was very clear. It was a scathing re review. So the NEB review of uh, pointed out, why did you not look at alternatives? We know that Site C is going to be one of the most expensive ways of producing. Power 
power. And the only reason it's being done is because this premier and her government are desperately trying to land at LNG, a mythical industry that's not coming here. They have signed contracts with wood fiber LNG to produce below market power at six cents a kilowatt hour, which means the public, through their hydro rates, are subsidizing each and every one of those jobs to the tune of $440,000 a year. That's the premier's choice. She chooses to subsidize the corporations at the expense of people while, while touting the mantra of it's all about jobs. Bill, if it was about jobs, no. Bill, we'd have distributed power in First across Nation BC. communities across That's BC. Right. British and on Columbia that, was not BC, built by NDP people without agree. vision and without courage. British Columbia was built by people like W.A.C. Bennett, who despite, people. Who despite all the criticism, whistle, I'd be blowing it right now. had yeah. the vision because to look ahead. Because we are now moving to the second half of our debate featuring questions from you the News 1130 audience, and we have added some of these questions down to one or two lines for time's sake. None of the candidates has seen the questions in advance. They may have anticipated some of them, but from Sandra Littell, is it fair for people living outside the Lower Mainland in places like Fort St. John or Kitimat to pay for the Portman Bridge unless they use it? Is it also fair for the rest of BC to pay for the Lower Mainland's transit infrastructure? And John Horgan, I'll let you begin. Sure. Well, thanks for the and question. This time we will try to stay to a minute. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the question. And I do believe it's fair that all British Columbians pay for the, the development and growth of our great province. And uh, people in, on Vancouver Island don't necessarily want to pay for infrastructure that they're not going to use, but they also understand that the infrastructure that they take advantage of has been paid for by everybody. It's a question of fairness. If you're going to build a province, you're building a province, not a region, not a city, but a whole province. And uh, certainly, I I would be happy to pay for roads in Fort St. John. I'm happy to pay uh, for infrastructure on the on the Central Coast. I'm also happy to pay to make sure the people in the Kootenays have the services that they need. I pay for the Allen Highway. Like, well, exactly. And, and uh, many people in British Columbia. toll. It, no, it's not. <laughs> but nor is the bridge in Kelowna. And I don't think the people in Kelowna want to pay a toll on a bridge. They're happy to have the infrastructure. And I think most British Columbians are charitable and generous when it comes to making sure that everyone everyone can move around and get the, get the economy going in, in each region of the province. That's good for everybody. I don't believe that penalizing people because there's congestion in an area helps anybody. And I know that the people in, the, in Metro Vancouver are quite happy to see prosperity in Prince George and Kamloops. And, and I just think that that's how you should proceed. Fairness for everybody. Well, it's not just that our kids, not just that people in Fort St. John are going to be paying for these reckless promises of the NDP. Um, it's, you know, through double the carbon taxes and some of the other proposals the NDP have. They are, we are also, they're also planning to raid our kids' savings account, to raid the $500 million we've set aside for our kids, and they're going to blow it in two years to pay for this promise. So not just people today, but our kids tomorrow. And so, Bill, in answer to the caller's question quite, uh, quite succinctly, no, I don't think it's fair. I think it's a bad uh, proposal, and I think most of all, um, raiding our kids' savings account is just about the worst thing, because it's not about... Not not everything's about just today. We need to be thinking about tomorrow. We need to be planning for our kids' that's future and for the long about, term. Right? And that's what Site C is all about. That's what LNG is all about. That's what the Prosperity Fund is all about. That's why we want to make sure that money is there for our kids. Andrew Weaver. Well, look, the, the BC Liberals promised the Prosperity Fund from LNG revenue. The reality is they're funding it from general revenues coming out from increased hydro rates, among other things, MSP premiums, etc. So the reality is it's, it's basically taking from the parents. We, we would frankly know much better what to do with the money for their kids than having the government put it away and use it for their prep projects. The problem with the with without tolling, the problem is that you end up getting political calculation coming into these decision making. So we get bridges in Kelowna, we get uh, Port Massey t tunnel replacements, as opposed to doing what's right, having an infrastructure plan and, and, and introducing it in a user pay model. If it was done fairly, uh, I think British Columbians would get behind it. And I, I do think it's unfair for people in Fort St. John to, to have to pay for, for the, the tolls of a road. But, but uh, uh, frankly, if we're going to build roads in Fort St. John, then perhaps they might be open to playing tolls there too. So user pay is a, is a good way to go in new infrastructure, and that's something that we, we would support. There will be some overlap. Uh, Alan asks, where will the traffic go when the Massey Bridge is built? I travel it every day, and a few cars exit for Richmond. So the Oak Street Bridge will now become the pothole, exactly. the bottleneck of the free world. Why? 
We are going to continue. I mean, I assume that was for me, Bill. Yeah, um, it will, everybody will get a chance. Um, we're going to continue to build infrastructure as we have. We've spent more money on infrastructure um, in the last, uh, since I've been Premier, I think, than any single government in the history of the province. And that's been, a lot of it's been spent building infrastructure like roads. I know we do it over vocal opposition from all the opposition but is parties. But it coordinated? But, no, it's well, yes, it is. I mean, it is coordinated. We do it piece, we have, you end up doing it a little bit piece by piece. But remember, the Massey Tunnel is going to take years to build. And the planning that we're doing around that is on the each side of it to make sure that we minimize all the bottlenecks, just like we did in the work with the Portman Bridge that uh, that the NDP and the Greens both opposed as well. We want to make sure that we are well, continuing to create country. those jobs, <laughs> that we are reducing the impact on our climate, and that we are uh, you reducing don't people's pro impact producing climate, so. pro that we are reducing commuting times. And that was the plan with the Portman Bridge. That will be the plan with the Massey Tunnel as well to make sure that we are ingress and egress, um, limiting the impact on other on other roadways. But you can only afford to do that if the economy is growing. The reason we've been able to put so much money into infrastructure is because our economy is growing. And by the way, we are doing all of this without going into deficit, without Amen. increasing the interest that we have to pay to banks overseas, because we've, mm -hmm. we've found a way to make sure that we control government spending, cut taxes, and grow is our economy. Are we at a yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, again, uh, the Premier is just making stuff up. She's saying it's going to take a long time to do this. They haven't found bottom yet, Bill, at the Massey Tunnel Replacement Project. They're still driving piles 900 meters down trying to find bottom. It's an ill-advised scheme. The better course of action is to twin the tunnel and then distribute that traffic throughout the region. That's what the mayors want to do. And you know why they want to do that, Bill? Because they live here. They understand the challenges because they face their people every single day. So you'd build another tunnel? I, I would work with the mayors to come up with the best plan possible to move the congestion to make sure we're doing it in a, in a sustainable way not alienating farmland critically important to us uh, in the BC NDP and I believe right across BC to make sure we're making the right choices for today and again the Premier will take us back down uh, uh, whatever road she wants to go down but today people are struggling people are frustrated at the increased costs that's why we're looking at affordability that's why we're looking at recreating the services that have been eroded under the BC Liberals and most importantly we have to make sure that we're working with all of the stakeholders, and that starts with the mayor's council, who have been working very, 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 very hard on this. Andrew Weaver. Well, this is the reason why we, are, we support the mayor's 10-year uh, vision for the transit plan. <laughs> Look, the building a Massey Bridge without any overall transit plan or any overall idea of what you're going to do doesn't, doesn't actually deal with the problem. It kicks the problem down to Oak, to Oak Street Bridge. There is no plan. There was no plan. It's just simply yet another election promise. And, and frankly, I think British Columbians are fed up with that. It Nadia, was actually Nadia, Nadia the says, last election, Nadia Bill. Says the federal government has tabled laws for marijuana, leaving much of the decision making to each province. How will BC ensure this substance doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Well, I'd, love, I'd love to address this question because we, we've spent a fair amount of time on that. Let's just remember it's 4:20 today, so that's a big uh, yeah. <laughs> people out there are, are uh, taking to the streets talking about this issue. Smoking um, in the park. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah, that's Vancouver, I guess. Um, look, we we recognize that uh, the cannabis industry in BC is a big industry. It's a multi-billion-dollar industry, and there is tax revenue there. We also recognize that the Trudeau plan is one that I think is troubling because it's going to put the distribution in the hands of the big multinationals again. We view the craft cannabis industry in a manner that's identical to the craft beer industry. We need to reduce inter interprovincial trade barriers to ensure that BC indust industry isn't there. We need to ensure that small mom and pop operations are regulated in a proper environment, and we need to ensure that that uh, the federal government doesn't actually, you know, make the multinationals come in. This is a bit like saying, you know, what do you want, Labatt's Blue or Molson Canadian, or would you rather have your local craft beer? I think most people would rather have their local craft beer, and it's good for our economy locally, and but provided there's a proper regulatory regime and it's coupled with substantive education to ensure that people are responsible. Christy Clark. Well, I mean, I think we should answer the question here. The question was, how do we that feel about how do we feel about getting <laughs> allowing this get in, getting into the hands of minors, or how do we stop it? And that is the number one priority for me is well, making sure we that we haven't stopped it now. That we well, making sure that we limit it once government has given it its its seal of approval. We need to have a system that makes sure that marijuana 
marijuana is not available to young people. And so I'm a little... Until I, what age? I'm, well, I'm, I mean, the federal government has set 18 as the bottom line. Um, I think in British Columbia, you can't get liquor till you're 19. For heaven's sakes, let's at least put it at 19. We're going to ask an expert panel to give us their best advice about how this should be done. No, we've I'm not, about this I'm for not, years. I'm not going to... stood by and done nothing. And we, haven't, and we haven't seen the legislation until this last week. So, and it was quite different from what the Liberals had proposed in the election campaign as well. So we're going to ask an expert panel to look at it and to give us their best advice. Should it be co-located in liquor stores? I don't think so. Because, in, you know, no one does that in the United States. And you don't want these two intoxicants sitting beside each other on the shelf. John Horgan. Thank you, Bill. And we've been thinking a lot about this as well. Since Mr. Trudeau uh, was elected on a platform to legalize marijuana, we've been working in, uh, in the NDP caucus to try and get to a place where we can protect our kids, make sure our communities are safe, and also reap the benefits that may well be there in terms of revenue for other programs. So what I did is I sent my two most senior people, Mike Farnworth and Carol James, to Washington and Oregon to talk to legislators there and to policymakers about what choices they made, what were the challenges in those jurisdictions jurisdictions as they move from decriminalization to legalization. We now have Alaska to the north of us. It's going to happen over the next year. I'm very confident that the work that we've already done in talking to other policymakers about what the choices are, what the trade-offs are, how will we distribute, how will we regulate, those are things that we've been thinking about for a long, long time. The Liberals, as uh, Mr. Weaver suggested, just awoken to this fact, and I think that's going to put the next year to be a, a catch-up. And ca none catch of them put it in liquor stores, and yet you want to. <laughs> Union jobs? Uh, well, look, that, that's about that's her position, and she's uh, again imposing her, what she wants my view to be on top of me. Is that I'm not talking, your view? I'm talking to everybody, Bill. I've talked to uh, pharmacies to make sure that those who are looking for cannabinoids for medicinal purposes are are necessarily comfortable dealing with their local pharmacy. So I've talked to the to the distributors of other uh, drugs in the community. I've talked to dispensaries that have been popping up, as you know, in every community across BC, and I've also talked uh, to the liquor distribution folks to see where, where's the best way to proceed. I would suggest it's probably going to be a mix, Bill. I thought, so it, was, I thought it was interesting. This is, just, this is just my comment. I thought it was interesting. The governor of Colorado said yesterday or the day before that they had found that uh, legalizing marijuana hadn't increased the use of marijuana among former non-users. Hmm. That people who chose alcohol continued to choose alcohol and people who had already chosen marijuana were now doing it legally. And so they have yeah, so yeah. much revenue coming in from the taxation that they yeah. don't even know what to do with well, it. That's not true, Andrew. That's not true. What we found in our uh, fact finding was that if you don't set the price point right, if you think of it as a cash cow, let's put a price up really high so we can get government revenue, the black market continues Steve. to exist. But Mr. Morgan, you, you did just say you want to... We want to get rid of the black market. You wanna that's the challenge. That's where you kids are going to be accessing. Okay. So kids including are be selling it in liquor stores. Kids are going to be Next. accessing. From now, the build. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Daphne Charmley wants to know. The Liberals say they are producing multiple units of what they call affordable housing. The disabled only get $375 a month. So how can affordable housing be higher than that for rent? And will the other parties raise the housing allowance for the disabled? We'll start with the Premier with Christy Clark, leader of the Liberal Party, and then get the re reaction from the other two. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Delphine, for the question. Um, we, uh, we are building uh, a billion, almost a billion dollars of low-cost affordable housing across the province, and that's going to include a mix. So it will include supportive housing for people who, you know, who have mental health and addictions issues. It will be uh, accessible housing for Is people who live with a disability. Is that housing? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, a, you know, it's about a billion dollars, and it's a billion dollars that we can afford because our economy is growing. And, you know, I, I, I know it frustrates Mr. Horgan when I talk about this, but remember, in the 1990s, the government had to cut spending on social programs like health care because they couldn't afford the bill. And the we want to make, because the, the economy was shrinking. The field, Ms. Clark. And, you were a member of the legislature. And, you should have known that. You were a member of the legislature from the 1990s, because, just after your internship because they for couldn't the BC afford it. Party. Remember the talking over? Because they, <laughs> because they couldn't afford it. And we, want it, we need to make sure that our economy continues to grow so that we can look after people who are disabled and who are struggling and are vulnerable in our society, and that's the investment that we're making. Mr. Horgan.
Oregon. We want to make life better for people on disabilities. That's why we're increasing the disability pension by $100 a month. We're also increasing, uh, putting in place a renter's rebate so that renters, who Ms. Clark doesn't seem to want to support, like uh, Delphine, will get $400 at the, at the beginning of each year to help them make ends meet. We're also going to put in place a poverty reduction plan bill, the only province in, in the country that doesn't have one. If you How does that a, work? Well, look at other jurisdictions, Bill. We've tabled legislation repeatedly to encourage this government to focus on trying to get out of the crisis we have with poverty in British Columbia. Inequality is a significant issue in this election campaign, but most importantly, it's a significant issue in communities right across BC. Child if poverty has gone down by 50% because we've done such a good, because the economy's done so much in terms of creating jobs. Andrew Weaver? Oh, so I get 40 seconds and she can talk over me, That's simply not true about that. It's, yes, it's cherry picking yeah. data is that all of Canada child poverty has gone down, but British Columbia has remained at the very yeah, bottom yeah. all along. Um, look, so Delphine's had a great question. We have promised in our platform, which will release the fully costed aspects of it on Monday next week, is we have, we've got to increase at 10% per year the rates that she's looking at to a 50% increase over five years. We recognize that people can't make ends meet right now, and including those on disability. We've also introduced the concept of basic income, and this is something that's important, particularly for youth transition. We'll apply it right, a, right, a, right away for those um, aging out of foster care. We'll, apply, we'll give them the basic income to get that start ahead. We'll also introduce pilot pro projects with a plan similar to, to, uh, to with, with a poverty reduction plan that we too agree, as, as, as my friend uh, Mr. Horgan has said there, we agree needs to be in place. So our approach to this is to actually bring in a basic income con concept. It's happening worldwide. Leaders want to, should lead, and in British Columbia we believe that BC Greens could show leadership in this area. And finally, with the renter rebate, uh, we disagree with that because we don't think someone uh, 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 living in a fifty thousand uh, dollar a year suite in downtown Vancouver really needs four hundred dollars a year. We'd prefer to see that money go to those who need it as opposed to those who don't. Didn't you back off on that? On uh, on it being universal? On that? because when I first we, we, heard that, I thought, well, when I was renting a fairly expensive town or a condo in Coal Harbor, mm -hmm. and I heard the policy come out, I went. Why would I get $400 a month? I agree. When somebody else should be getting $800 a month. I agree. Month. In our election platform, we're talking about making sure we're getting money into the pockets of those people who need it. But those initially, it came out as a universal. That was the interpretation. That was the interpretation by those that, that heard me speak. Yes, that's correct. But the, the directive here is that, that an NDP government led by John Horgan will be making sure that those who are struggling, like Delphine, to find a place that they can afford to live in the most unaffordable jurisdiction in Canada will have a break. Help is on the way for renters that are have, that are struggling right now, and it's in the form because of Because about half government. the people who live in Greater Vancouver rent, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, Ms. Clark uh, sees them as second-class citizens. I don't. I see them as full participants in our economy, and uh, they don't. if they can't find the place to live, they're going to be struggling, and that's why we have homelessness uh, right through the roofs. Ten cities in places like Abbotsford, Maple Ridge, uh, Victoria, Vancouver. That That's crisis stuff, and the Premier wants to talk about other things. Another day, another policy. Uh, Mitch Williams says all three parties have different philosophies on child care. Can you each explain why yours is preferable to the other? And I'll start with Andrew Weaver. Well, thank you. Our approach is to recognize that there are some barriers right now for access to child care. Right now, if you are looking for child care, you will I have to find the money up front, and when you file your tax return at the end of the year, you'll you'll get a, a child care tax benefit. Our approach is to, is to say that we shouldn't have that as a barrier up front. So what we will do is provide free child care for those who want, and if you earn over eighty thousand dollars a year, it will be viewed as a taxable benefit. So that money is no longer a barrier to child care. We also support. We, there needs to be increased capacity, and we also need to support people going into the programs so to become child care providers as well as early childhood. Educators. How many years would it take to roll that? Out. Our plan, you know, we're when our with our our, our platform, we're thinking about the four-year mandate. Our mandate would be four years. All of our policies are, are, are there to be introduced over the four-year mandate, uh, and our costing will be balanced, as, as we'll release next week, over the four-year mandate uh, that we're seeking from the people of British Columbia. John Horgan, your $10 a day daycare, I believe, is going to take 10 years right. to achieve. That's right. It's the plan that was put together by uh, child care advocates here in British Columbia, and it's one that I embrace, and it's going to take time. We have to create spaces. We have to train early child with educators, and we need to make sure that those programs are in place in year one, year two, year three of our fiscal plan. And over the 10-year period, it will be fully implemented. But this is the key here, Bill, is that this is not just about child care. It's about the economy as well. If women are reluctant to get back into 
the workforce because they can't find affordable, quality, accessible childcare, that's a negative on that family's economic activity, and it's a, a negative on the broader community. I talk to employers, and their biggest concern when it comes to childcare is that productivity is declining because parents are concerned about their kids. So our plan will start by focusing on the most difficult uh, places to find care for infants and toddlers, and we'll build from there so we're getting into the kindergarten, into, into after-school care, and so on. But the challenge is that the BC Liberals have got an ad hoc approach to this. They haven't focused their energies on it. Families are struggling. I represent an area on Vancouver Island with, with the fast growing, one of the fastest growing uh, community on Vancouver Island. Young families are coming and they're coming with children and they can't afford or, or much less find childcare. This is a big economic issue and that's why we're so focused on it. And well, it I'd say it's a, big, it's a big economic issue everywhere. I know that newsrooms I've worked in, uh, the reporters, the researchers, the producers, uh, they have all struggled mm -hmm. uh, because they live in downtown Vancouver or on the North Shore or in the surrounding area where child care is really, really hard and really expensive. Christy Clark. Well, I mean, the, what you've heard from both of these guys is the reason that the NDP are going to have to almost double carbon taxes, why they're going to have to raise income taxes, why they're going to have to raid the, our kids' inheritance in the prosperity fund. It's we because it's a one point, it's a one point five billion, but you're not going to deliver it till most kids have a driver's license. Um, it's a one point five billion dollar plan. It's really it's uh, it was unaffordable in Quebec where taxes are five thousand dollars a year higher on average it is unaffordable here as well and in Quebec what happened was with this ten dollar a day plan is they ended up creating wait lists that were up to four years and people who were wealthy were much more likely to get a child care space than people who weren't so what happened so was try, what happened was that the people who could least afford it were subsidizing the people who could best afford it what we need to do is is to do what the Trudeau government is doing, which is increase more, increase spaces in British Columbia. So our plan would mean 4,000 more spaces in the province. We think that the feds are probably, when they when they apportion the money, will probably add another 4,000. Just like on transit, we're matching them with an affordable plan that will mean, ultimately, up to 8,000 new spaces in the next four years. That'll do a where, lot where to relieve... for the past 60 It'll years, do a Ms. lot Clark. to where relieve... Where have you been where well, families have been struggling without access to quality? Okay, well, let me well, get... 15, Let me get the 15, next 000, question because it ties, new spaces. It ties directly with this, and I think it's aimed primarily at uh, Ms. Clark. D. Robson says, the last election, the B.C. Liberals ran on the platform of families first. I don't know any families who feel they were put first. Why trust them? Well, in terms of the lower, lowest middle class taxes um, in the country, I mean, in the 1990s, remember, middle class taxes were double what they are today. And um, making sure that we are supporting people and finding their way into work. We've got, we've got about 4,000, a little more than 4,000 people now finding their way to, from welfare to work. And, you know, 220,000 new jobs, the best way to make life affordable for people is first, leave more money in their pocket, and second, make sure that they have a good, stable, full-time job. So. 220,000 new jobs, over 90% of them full-time in British Columbia. I mean, one of the things that we should remember in this discussion is that the plans that both of the men at the table with me have would do nothing but chase jobs out of the province. They would kill jobs. When the NDP were in power, 50,000 people fled British Columbia looking for work. That is not a way to make life more affordable for families. And if you want to look after the people that you love, the most Th the thing that is most important is making sure you have a good job. Mr. Horgan. Well, I agree that with the right. premise of the question is why should we believe her now, Bill? Why should we believe the B.C. Liberals now? They said they were going to be debt-free. They're not. They said that they were going to create 100,000 jobs in LNG. They didn't. She's talking today about uh, the Prosperity Fund as something that has been there for decades and is sacred. It was created last year from medical services premiums, which have doubled on the B.C. Liberal that watch. That isn't true. Hydro rates have gone up 87 percent since the BC Liberals came to power just three weeks ago it went up another three and a half percent we're gonna freeze those rates we're gonna for, for the, the first two years to make sure we can get to the bottom the depth of the challenges of BC Hydro deferred debt there that we're gonna have to pay for down the road the premier ran last time on promises that she didn't keep and now she wants people to believe her now I don't think they should I think people are looking for a government that's working for them not the not the big donors not the lobbyists that drive the BC Liberal uh, troll truck they want people to focus on them and that's what I intend 
intend to do. The Services for people not fighting with teachers, not fighting with school boards, not fighting with parents, but making sure our kids get the quality education they're going to need to succeed in this great yeah. Andrew Weaver. Well, putting families first uh, is, is a, is a soundbite because the evidence is pretty clear that families have not been put first. What's, who's been put first? Other corporate donors to the Liberal Party of British Columbia. You know, we, uh, they talk about jobs. They talk about creating jobs. They actually are missing out on the new economy. Around the world, people are moving towards uh, innovative, creative jobs in the, in the creative economy, in the building green jobs in the manufacturing sector. We're missing out because we're chasing the economy of yesteryear. BC Greens have a plan. Our plan is actually to build the economy of tomorrow, not chase the plan, the economy of yesteryear, which is the BC Liberal approach. We recognize that people need to think about roads in other ways. Roads, at the, in the BC Liberal view, is about taking people from A to B. Roads, in our view, is taking also information from A to B, which is why we'll invest in broadband across the province to ensure that the communities in the Kootenays in northern BC have access to broadband redundancy, which will allow the tech sector to come together with the resource sector, which will actually allow the new economy to develop in BC. And it's, you know, the Premier talks about jobs. Well, how is the gas industry doing up in northeastern BC now? It's flat. It's no more than flat. They, they can't sell the stuff. The, the, the value is in the liquids, and some of the gas is even being pumped right back in the ground because there is no market for natural gas. Trying to squeeze water from a stone doesn't work, even if you squeeze it harder, and that is the Liberal approach. Darlene uh, Lanou, to all party leaders, will any of you address the poverty level of income for seniors who worked and supported this country and are now on fixed income and can barely survive. I believe the supplement for low-income seniors should be raised so all increases such as hydro, cable, food, gas can be kept up with. Christy Clark. Uh, well, she's right. Uh, Premier, uh, seniors built this country and built this province, and we need to uh, make sure that they get a good go of it, um, especially in their later years. And that means building a healthcare system that works. So we've doubled the number of doctors that are graduating. We have increased the number of nurses in our province. We've built hospitals all across the province. Not a single hospital, new hospital, got built in the 1990s. And healthcare is vitally important for seniors. So is income. And so what we, you know, we are introducing a new Seniors Active Living tax credit. We are supporting seniors with a respite tax credit for people caring for seniors um, in their homes. Um, and we are working with the BC Munici Union of BC Municipalities to build age-friendly communities. We cannot, we will not make seniors' lives better by doubling the carbon tax, as the NDP would do. We will not make seniors' lives better by taking all the MSP savings that have already been found and dumping it in to the uh, a 20% increase in income tax, and we will not make seniors' lives better by making life more unaffordable. Low taxes, smaller government, and making sure we're in, we have the resources that we need to invest in health care, that's how we can honor seniors and make sure that they have what they need to live. John well, Norman. to live well. Thank, thank you, Bill. Nine out of ten seniors care facilities in British Columbia, according to the seniors' advocate, are underfunded when it comes to providing supports for uh, seniors that are staying in those facilities. Ninety percent, Bill, of the seniors' homes in BC are not meeting minimum staffing standards. Home care visits in some cases are limited to 15 minutes. So we want to keep people in their homes as long as possible. But if you can't provide services that are adequate for seniors in home care, they're pushed to other, uh, other places. I met a woman named Marjorie, 93 and three quarters, Bill, and she was trying to get out of her home into a continuing care facility. She was put on a wait list at 93 and three quarters and now she's in an acute care bed in a hospital taking up the most expensive space in our health care system. The BC Liberals have failed seniors, failed them miserably when it comes to caring for them in their latter years. B British Columbians owe a debt of gratitude to those who have come before us. We need to p treat them with respect and make sure that there are services there for them when they need them. That hasn't been happening on the BC Liberal Watch. Again, why should you believe them now? Andrew Weaver. Well, specifically to the question, we would increase those rates at 10% per year for five years to a 50% increase because we recognize that seniors are struggling. We recognize also that the approach of using boutique tax credits, which is the liberal approach, is one that doesn't benefit seniors. I, I don't know how many seniors have come to my office as, a, as an MLA and, and, and didn't realize that they shouldn't even be paying MSP, is they are being taxed in a flat rate and they're struggling to make ends meet. In fact, the whole issue of MSP that I brought into the legislature 
legislature a few years ago was brought to me by seniors at the Monterey Center who told me about this was one of the barriers to them uh, affording to live. And these mean-spirited uh, policies of, of rate hikes that affect seniors do not address the fundamental issues that we need to address, which is affordability. So we also will, will increase the concept of basic income again. And when you think of this over the long term, you think about investing in it when you can and taking from it you know, when you can't. It's like a, a, a fund that you save for the future. I'm confused on this on <coughs> MSP because I believed that your platform was that uh, you were going to reduce the MSP payment by half right after the election. January 1st. In Jan January, January 1st. Yep. Yesterday, if you register, Bill. Yesterday. If you register. Right. Yesterday, Mike DeYoung said it was not a promise. It wasn't cast in stone. It was um, what they would like to do. We are, our commitment is we are going to, on January 1st, for middle class British Columbians, so everybody who's earning a household income up to $120,000. Household, that means household income. two people? That's right. And they will, and that, the reason you need to register is proof of income, because we want to make sure we're targeting this at the middle class. It will be chopped in half. We won't raise taxes by an equivalent amount, which I know is what the, which I believe is what the NDP is planning. We are going to then, as the economy grows, get on with eliminating MSP. So. The faster the economy grows, the faster we'll be able to eliminate it altogether, which is, you know, for me, you don't just, you know, take tax, you get, take people's taxes out of one pocket and then add it to another. That's the NDP plan. They want to, they've said, and Carol James has been really clear about on? this. Where we get, we're cutting the no, revenue to government. <laughs> it means that for a billion, it's a billion dollar, government? it's a billion dollar tax cut. And it means that there is a billion dollars less coming out of people's pockets that is going into government. We are not replacing that with increased taxes, which is what the NDP and I believe the Greens are planning to do. So is Mr. Leon confused yesterday? No. What he said was, as the economy grows, we will work to eliminate, we are going to eliminate MSP. But the economy, Bill, needs to continue to grow. If we end up in a situation with a government that kills jobs, slows the economy down, and sends people they out of province, they doubled will, MSP premium. People are they paying now. Them until people are their paying jobs now what they paid the in 1993. Until their jobs were on the line, and then they came up with a half-baked plan. People are paying what it's they pay in 1993. They will be as of January 1st. We'll be back to 1993 rates before we get on with as the economy grows, reducing and eliminating MSP altogether. And what are you doing? With they, MSP? they doubled MSP premiums, Bill. So what are you that, doing? Well, well, I think we need to make it abundantly clear to your listeners that this didn't just happen yesterday. Since 2001. Most of us no, because well, we've been well, paying. Uh, well, yes. most, most of us need to be reminded this is a flat tax, the only province in the country that has one. If you make $40,000 a year or $400,000 a year, you pay the same amount. And that's and not fair. It's not fair. And BC Liberals want you to register for their reductions. When they send out they send out debt collection agencies to track down 22-year-olds so they're going to pay their MSP premiums, if you can track 20-year-olds, you can certainly track the incomes of families that are paying the MSP now. This notion that, well, we'll give it to you, as, as Mr. Weaver said, we'll give it to you if you know about but it. But are you this ending thing, it? We're, we are what going are to gonna we, do? What's your, we are going to eliminate <laughs> the increases that were in the budget. We're going to do that in January in January of 2018, and then we're going to work with a with a panel to eliminate them over the course of the next three years. And that's in the interest of, of regular people. We're there to help. We're not there to hinder. But this you're not. But you're not eliminating. We're, we're we're going to cut them in half by uh, we're using the fiscal framework. This is the part that amazes me about Ms. Clark's uh, uh, frustration with our plan. I guess it's because it, it in the center of it is people, and the thing that's missing from their plan is people. Bill, we're going to make sure that there's help I, on the way. Bill, can I Tell you about replace, plan, how are you so. going to replace the revenue, though? I think that's we, the thing that most of us are, okay. are, are, are wondering about. Every other country we're getting tight for time. You can't yeah, figure it out. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'd like to tell you about our plan because we were the first out of the gates on this. The reality is we've had MSP in, in British Columbia since the 60s. We've had successive Liberal, NDP, Socre governments, and none of them have addressed it. We would address it, and we would follow the model in Ontario that turns it from a regressive system, a one-size-fits-all system, to a progressive system. We recognize 
but if you're earning uh, $50,000 a year, paying MSP is a hardship. If you're earning $5 million a year, paying MSP isn't. We also recognize that union contracts across British Columbia have negotiated this as a, as a costed benefit. And so our introduction will ensure that the costed benefit remains one. It'll be progressive, it'll be like on your uh, statement, you see EI, CPP, but you also see a health care premium, which will go from zero to, uh, in Ontario, it goes from zero to $900 if you earn over $200,000 a year. So that would be something similar here in BC, cost revenue neutral, but in fact, we would save hundreds of millions of dollars because we would eliminate the need for debt collection agencies. We have Revenue Canada that does that. We would eliminate the need for those monthly bill billings. We'd eliminate the need for people to apply for, for, for this 50% reduction. It would be simpler, it would eliminate red tape, and it would be fair. Okay, we are uh, getting close to the end of this, and so what I would like to do is uh, give each of you a chance for your closing statements, uh, and we'll start with uh, in reverse order from what we started at the beginning of the show, and Andrew Weaver, you go first. Uh, thank you. Um, in my opinion, I think in the opinion of British Columbians, this election boils down to the question of trust. Do you trust a government who has been in power for 16 years? who continues to take corporate and union donations, who continues to put corporations ahead of, ahead of people. Do you trust the official opposition, the NDP, who've had 16 years to inspire people to get behind them as an alternative? Or do you trust the BC Greens, a party that does what it says it will do? When we say we'll ban union and corporations, we did it. Just yesterday, I declined a, 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 yet another corporate donation. We believe we have a plan that puts people first, a plan that actually recognizes the economy of tomorrow is here and we can take advantage of it. We have a plan that ensures that we build on our strengths, not chase the weaknesses of others. We have candidates who are second to none, who are not political career politicians, who are stepping aside from their careers because they believe that politics in BC is broken and we need to rebuild it to put people first and to ensure that we're prepared for the 21st century economy. Thank you. Christy Clark. Thank you, Bill, and thanks to everybody for listening to us today or watching us on TV. Um, let, me, let me say this. Uh, people can propose all kinds of plans, um, but if you don't have a plan that you can afford and you can pay for, it is not a plan at all. We need plans that are, that we can realize, that we can make happen for people. Um, and because I, I believe people just work way too hard in our province and they contribute way too much to get it all thrown away in reckless spending. We cannot afford to double the carbon tax in British Columbia. Our kids deserve better than a government that would raid their savings account when we should be building that savings for them rather than spending it in just a couple of years and when we run surpluses we shouldn't use it to grow government we should give that money back to people governments have no right to say and cannot say better than you about how to spend your money so our plan is about controlling government spending keeping it small while we keep the economy big it's about cutting people's taxes not taking money out of one pocket and taking it and then taking it out of the other and it's about creating jobs I really believe in the hard work of British Columbians and the ability ability of British Columbians to dream and imagine and make a better future for themselves. And we will only be able to keep BC strong if we have a plan, if it's a costed plan, if it's a realizable plan, if it's one that makes sure that we keep our kids and our children's future at the forefront of our minds. And so I'm seeking a second term because BC is just really starting to get on a roll now. We have so much more to do. We can't take the risk of throwing it all away. And I hope on May 9th, people will decide they want to vote for a strong BC and a bright future. Thank, Thank you. you. John Horgan. Thank you, Bill, and thanks to the listeners for enduring the past hour and a half. Uh, I know that uh, many people had other things to do today. I'm grateful to uh, my two colleagues here for the opportunity to share our ideas and to show people the stark differences between the choices that people will be able to make on uh, the 9th of May. I'm in this election campaign because I care about people. I got involved in political life because of my neighbors. I've been in the same house on the same road for the past 25 years. My neighbors got me involved. My community got me involved. I am so honored and privileged to be leading a political party at a time when people are yearning for help. People are yearning for a government that will work for them. I put forward three basic commitments in this election campaign. I'm going to make life more affordable for people. I'm going to provide services for people that have been eroded under the BC Liberal Watch and I'm going to make sure 
the economy is there for everybody, working for everybody, not flat wages, not part-time jobs, but an economy that will grow for everyone. 96,000 jobs in our capital plan that will build schools, build hospitals, build infrastructure for all British Columbians in every corner of this great province. I'm proud to be a British Columbian. I'm proud to be involved in, in political life at a time when people are craving a change. I don't believe we can afford another four years of BC Liberals and Christy Clark. I think it's time now to have a government that's working for people. We have a little time left. I'm going to ask you each a short question. What did you say to your candidates in order to get them to come on board and put their lives on hold to do this? Me? Yeah. Well, I'm really excited about the 87 candidates we have running. They reflect the inclusivity and the diversity of this great province. I said to them, join with me and let's make your community better. Join with me and let's make BC better. I am just delighted to be, as I say, the leader of a political party at a time in history, 2017, where people want to see bold initiatives like $10 a day childcare to make BC better. Ms. Clark. I said to them, as I did in the last election, the first time I ran for Premier, I said, you know, if you don't run, then who will? I mean, this is, we've heard it today, it's a pretty negative business. There's lots of uh, name calling and all the rest of it. But I said to them, you know, it's tough. It's not always easy to hear that stuff. But, you know, if you don't run for office, then how are we going to get people to do it? So guys like Dave Calder, for example, um, in, in uh, Saanich in Sydney, an ama Saanich, I should say, amazing candidate, a national rower for us. We've got Tracy Reddys, who's running for us, the former CEO of Coast Capital. It is an incredible diverse group of candidates, and I'm so grateful that all of them decided they wanted to say yes, and all of them care about creating jobs in the province. Andrew Weaver. The candidates that have joined the BC Greens share similar stories to mine, is that they are joining because they could no longer stand by and watch what's going on in British Columbia politics. You know, I watched as this government uh, tore apart the climate leadership of the previous government. I couldn't stand by and look my students in the face and say that, you know, you should do something if I wasn't willing to do it myself. We have an incredible team. We have six PhD scientists running. Like, what other party has six PhD scientists, the BC Green do? We have a, you know, a, a pediatric researcher who does cancer research at the UBC Children's Hospital. We have people from across the province who are stepping aside, multitude of teachers and so forth, because they care about our democracy and they want to reclaim our democracy for the people of British Columbia. Thank you to each of the candidates and to everyone watching and listening on News 1130, News1130.com, Facebook and City TV. We'll be putting the debate in its entirety on, on the News 1130 YouTube channel so you can watch it as many times as you like. And don't forget to vote May 9th. Hopefully this debate has made the decision easier for you. I'm Bill Good. Thanks again for watching and listening. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.